Welcome to another World Heritage Wednesday and I'm in the Iron Bridge Gorge. Now this one, this World Heritage site happens to be my local. I do live in the county of Shropshire which is the same place that you'll find the gorge. So Shropshire is a rather rural county now. At one point it was one of the most industrialised parts of the world and a lot of that industry was centred around the Iron Bridge Gorge and where I am right now which is Colbrook Dell. A little bit of history of the gorge. The gorge itself was created probably due either during the Anglian or the Devensian Ice Age as the River Severn cut its way through the rock. What it did do was exposed layers of limestone, coal and ironstone that could then be used for industry. So the land was owned by the abbeys, Wenlock and Bildos in particular, and they used to be the centre, as in the case of many of the medieval world, was the, used to be the centre of education and industry. This all changed with the dissolution of the monasteries under Henry VIII and the land was open for private purchase. Now some of this land was purchased in 1544 by Sir Robert Brooke and was then passed to his grandson Sir Basil Brooke in, towards the end of the 1500s and they started to develop a bit of the iron industry almost as a continuation of the iron industry that the Priory had been running. Now the Priory had been doing an old medieval method called bloomery basically involves these large cast iron vessels and the melting of somewhat poorer quality iron products. And this method really had been going on since the Roman period and it was what happened after this that really set the stage for the modern world and why Ironbridge itself is actually such an important site. So what changed? Well a lot of this comes down to one man, well one family but one man in particular, that's Abraham Darby. Abraham Darby was born in 1678 in nearby Dudley and he spent a lot of time down in Bristol learning the brass metalworking trade down there and in 1708 he came to Colbrookdale and leased the furnaces in that building there to start the development of his own industry. So what did Darby do differently? Really two big things that were different. First off he develops the process for using coke as a fuel source whereas previously in the iron industry charcoal had been the main source of fuel. The problem with charcoal is that you need a lot of forests to for the fuel, it takes a long time to grow the wood, so it leads to a very slow industry. People, now people had tried coal, but coal tended to have too high sulfur content, so this made for a very brittle iron product. So it was really with the development of coke and Darby's blast furnace that the iron industry was able to essentially enter the realm of mass production. Now within Darby's blast furnace what would happen is you'd throw in coke and ironstone and limestone in at the top of the furnace. You'd have the bellows pushing air into the furnace to provide oxygen for the fire and then you'd be able to tap off the iron products at the base of the furnace. The molten slag where a lot of the impurities had reacted with the limestone would sit on top of that so you'd be able to drain the iron off before you get down to the slag and the waste. And this was the second big invention that Bobby had done and that was his use of a sand casting method rather than a clay casting one. Now the sand casting method basically was much quicker to do, it was much easier and much cheaper. So you're able to churn out a lot more material in a lot less time. And he learned this industry from he learned this method from the brass industry. Abraham Darby, in his sand casting method, was able to produce not just the pig iron, but also iron products for use for on the mass market. And what was the item that he developed? The humble cooking pot. That's right. His industry was based around the home, around the cooking pots and cauldrons, and these were able to be produced on mass, and eventually they were shipped all over the world. And it was all from this furnace and a handful of others in the Iron Bridge Gorge that produced all the iron for this. Now by 1713 he'd constructed his first purpose-built coke blast furnace, whereas the old furnace here was a charcoal one that had been converted. And, uh, and sadly in 1717 Abraham Darby died. The industry passed on to his son, also called Abraham Darby, the second 
and he continued the development of his father's legacy. They also made the first cast iron rails here along with cast iron steam engine parts and products. So this is, you know, quite the centre of the industrial revolution and the iron industry as, as a whole. Now, this, now with the death of Abraham Darby II, we get to Abraham Darby III. Yep, there's three of them. And Abraham Darby III is the man that is responsible for the gorge's most famous landmark, and that's the Iron Bridge itself. So ultimately, this is what people come to the Iron Bridge Gorge for, the bridge itself. Completed in 1779, it was the first bridge anywhere in the world to be constructed entirely out of wrought iron, and is one of the few examples of an early iron bridge that's still standing anywhere in the world today. Obviously the gorge itself takes its name from it, as does the World Heritage Site that is associated with it. The World Heritage Site itself covers about five and a half square kilometres right the way through the gorge and includes not just the, but also includes several other sites along the banks of the River Severn, including parts of the old furnaces and some of the old mining areas. There are several museums associated with the gorge, the most notable one being the Blisthill Victorian Village, which incorporates parts of the old Blisthill furnaces, parts of the Shropshire Canal, along with preserved examples of a Victorian village. Now the village itself incorporates several actual existing Victorian buildings that were on site, along with ones that were taken from around Telford and were brought with brick, pretty much brick by brick. Okay, so this is the Blist Hill Brick and Tar Works and it was founded in the 1830s by the Maidley Wood Company as a secondary business to the ironworks and it's one of the original buildings you'll find in the Blist Hill Museum. So the height of its production, this building could produce one and a half million bricks or 500 million tiles a year and they were shipped out via the links to the canal that's just up there, Shropshire Canal which were then allowed to be shipped around the rest of the country. This was prior to the railway days. So this is the Hay Incline Plain and was completed in 1793 and was built as an alternative to the tradi traditional canal and lock system. So down there it's towards the River Severn and the idea being that canal boats would come to the base of the incline and be loaded onto a cart there'd be counterweight on the other set of rails and that will go down the hill pulling the other canal boat up the hill towards the Shropshire Canal which is just over there. The, canal, the boat would then be able to traverse the canal and carry on to the ironworks or the brickworks. Time-wise it would take an average of about four or five minutes to get a boat from the very bottom of the incline right the way to the top which is considerably faster than it would be if there was a series of locks getting up this incline I mean, it's really quite a steep slope coming up from the Seven Gorge up to the top. So a much faster, much more efficient alternative to what was used at the time. So why was the, the Iron Bridge built? Well, the bridge was built for two reasons. First one, they actually need to be a crossing between the north and south banks of the River Seven, and a bridge is the easiest way to do that. But the other reason was that Abraham Darby was using the Iron Bridge as a way of selling his products and demonstrating the quality and the versatility of the iron that he was producing. They also provided the iron for the first iron frame building produced anywhere in the world and that's the Ditherington Flax Mill in Shrewsbury. Now what was the legacy of the gorge? Well the legacy really is the modern age. When you think that this is where mass production of iron started, this is where we get modern blast furnace production and developments. These processes then get worked on by other companies and other developers and improved upon over the years and we end up with the modern, not just iron industry but steel industry and other metal working industries that we've got worldwide. It allowed for the development of the railway networks and the canal networks, modern transportation systems. It really fired up the modern age from Danis Valley. And that's why the bridge and the gorge was added to the UNESCO World Heritage List in 1986, becoming one of the first sites in the United Kingdom to be given such a prestigious status. <laughs>